Good evening. There's encouraging news from the VLT, or Very Large Telescope, in northern Chile. The first of the four eight-meter mirrors is now in place, and we are getting pictures. Look at this superb image of the Butterfly Nebula. And when completed, the VLT will be much the most powerful telescope ever built. Now, I know this program's called The Sky at Night, but occasionally we have to deal with the sky by day. What about the sun? The sun is a star 93 million miles away, a huge globe of incandescent gas. In some ways, it's variable. Every 11 years it's active, we have many of the dark patches known as sunspots. It then dies down in minimum, and we may have many spotless days. Well, we are now past the last minimum, and working up toward the next maximum, due around about 2000, 2001. But a word of warning here. The sun is dangerous. Never look straight at it through any telescope or binoculars, even with a dark filter added. You will burn your eye out and blind yourself. There's only one safe way to do it. Use your telescope as a projector and throw the sun's image onto a screen held behind the eyepiece. There's only one golden rule for looking straight at the sun. Don't. Now, my subject is the moon. Uh, Ian Nicholson knows far more about the sun than I do. So, Ian, welcome back. Okay. Now that we're safely past the last solar minimum, what's happening? I suppose the best way to try and understand what's happening is to start right at the centre of the sun and work out. If we could take a slice through the sun, look right into its interior, we'd find in the centre there's the core. That occupies about a quarter of the sun's diameter. The temperature there is about 15 million degrees. And it's under those conditions of temperature that hydrogen combines to form helium with the release of energy. And something like four million tonnes of matter every second is converted into energy inside the sun. Now that energy then flows out through the surrounding region, which is called the radiative zone. And it's carried by photons, little bits of light energy, fighting their way out towards the surface. The last third of the distance, from about 70% of the sun's diameter up to the surface, it goes through something called the convective zone. And that's where you have gas physically moving. You have plumes of hot gas rising towards the surface, giving out their energy into space, cooling and sinking to be reheated again. So that takes us to the surface. Now, the visible surface that we can see uh, is called the photosphere, or sphere of light. That's the thin layer, a few hundred kilometers thick, out of which all the visible light emerges, and where we see the sunspots. Then if we go beyond the photosphere into uh, the further reaches of the sun's atmosphere, we come first of all to the chromosphere, a thin layer, a couple of thousand kilometres thick, and then to the corona, which is the extensive outer atmosphere of the sun, very tenuous, and we can only see the corona normally with the naked eye at a time of a total solar eclipse. As you see on the 11th of August next year, 1999, if you go to Cornwall or part of Devon. Indeed, and if the sky happens to be clear. Well, let's hope. <laughs> Well, really, of course, the sun's atmosphere is, is quite a puzzling place. If we start off uh, looking at what happens to its temperature, if we start off at the photosphere, the temperature initially begins to drop from about 6,000 to roughly 4,000 degrees at the top of the photosphere. Then in the chromosphere, it begins to rise again, gently at first, and then extremely rapidly in the transition region that separates the chromosphere from the corona. And by the time we get into the corona, the temperature's got up to anything between about 1 and 6 million degrees. And that really is rather puzzling, because if heat is flowing out from the interior of the sun, you'd expect the temperature to get lower as you get further from the photosphere, instead of increasing as it does in the corona. And that's one of the big mysteries about the sun that a lot of effort's going into trying to solve at this time. The corona itself, of course, is quite complex. It has, as you can see in X-ray images like this one, it is so hot that it gives out X-rays, and an X-ray image will show bright concentrated regions where gas is at a higher temperature and density, surrounded by quiet regions, and then these dark so-called coronal holes where the temperature is uh, lower, where the density is lower, and it's out of those so-called holes that atomic particles can escape into space and form part of what's called the solar wind, a stream of electrons and protons that flows away from the sun, blows past the Earth at a speed of something like 400 kilometers per second. And which has tremendous effects upon the Earth's magnetosphere and magnetic field. Indeed, that's right. We can think about the Earth's magnetic field as if the Earth had a bar magnet embedded inside it with north and south magnetic poles. And we can visualize lines of magnetic force connecting those poles. 
Now, if the solar wind wasn't there, the Earth's magnetic field would be quite symmetrical, as we see here. But the effect of the solar wind is that it pushes it in on the sun-facing side and drags it out into a long tail called the magnetotail on the downstream side. And that, of course, is uh, showing that the solar wind has a profound effect on our Earth's magnetosphere. Now, the other thing that happens, of course, is that atomic particles uh, coming from the sun can flow down into the Earth's atmosphere near the poles along these lines of force and they interact with atoms and molecules in the upper air to cause them to give off light and give us those patterns of shimmering patterns of light that we see in the polar skies and which we call the aurorae, which are much more common when the sun is at its peak of activity. What are the main manifestations of this increased activity on the sun? Well, the most obvious manifestation will be an increase in the number of sunspots. And we might even see some enormous groups like this one that was uh, visible back in 1947. I remember that one. Indeed, well, sunspots, of course, are uh, cooler regions on the surface of the sun. They're a couple of thousand degrees cooler than the surrounding photosphere, and so they appear dark just by contrast with their surroundings. There are also areas of concentrated magnetic field in the sun, and what we believe happens is that bunches of magnetic field lines under the sun, uh, they form sort of tubes, and if these tubes develop a kink in them, they'll burst through the photosphere, and where the uh, magnetic field lines come out, then we get a spot of one polarity where they loop back into the sun's surface again we get the spot of the opposite polarity and this kind of thing can be studied in what's called magnetograms which are images that really show where the magnetic fields are concentrated this one here shows quite a small area of the sun's surface and the bright patches correspond to where magnetic field lines are coming out of the sun's surface and the dark patches to where they're going back in so there'll be an increase in sunspot activity, but prominences are another phenomenon. These are huge clouds of gas suspended in the sun's atmosphere, which sometimes are eruptive and catapult up to hundreds of thousands of kilometers high. The most energetic kind of uh, phenomena associated with the solar cycle are flares. Mm. Now, these are immense releases of energy, energy that's tied up in the magnetic fields that permeate the sun's atmosphere. And when a flare goes off, it's an explosive release of energy, visible light, x-rays, particles, and a huge amount of energy. You're talking about the emission of something like 10 billion one megaton nuclear devices in 10 or 20 minutes. So once those energetic particles and x-rays blast off into space, they impinge, of course, on the Earth's magnetosphere. They have all kinds of effects. They produce um, uh, disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field. Compass needles change direction. Surges are produced in uh, power transmission lines. The power maybe goes down. Satellites are sometimes knocked out of commission. And uh, even computers have been known to crash. So we are indeed directly affected by what is going on in these solar flares. It affects the corona, too. Indeed, it does. Um, the size of the corona and the intensity of the corona changes. Around about the time of sunspot minimum, the corona is generally fairly wishy-washy and, and weak. Around about the time of maximum, it's bigger, brighter, and more uniformly spread around the disk of the sun. It really is a marvellous sight. You know, Ian, even though the sun is our nearest star, there's a great deal that we don't know about it. What's being done now to monitor it? Well, of course, it's being studied from ground level all the time, but there's a whole flotilla of spacecraft and satellites up there looking at it. For example, there's the Japanese spacecraft Yoko that was launched back in 1991, and that is an X-ray imaging uh, satellite. So it takes daily images like this one here, showing concentrated areas of activity in the sun's corona above where the sunspots are. And then, of course, there is Ulysses, a joint uh, European and uh, American spacecraft, which was launched uh, back in uh, the early 1990s and headed out towards Jupiter, was deflected by Jupiter, and came back in towards the sun again, so that uh, during 1994 and 95, it passed, first of all, over the south pole of the sun, and then over the north pole of the sun and went way out again. It's at its maximum distance now and it's winging its way in. It will pass over the poles of the sun again in 2000 and 2001, just about the time yes. that the sun is reaching its maximum peak of activity. Yes, indeed. And one of the things that Ulysses can do, of course, is to look down on the poles, which is something that we simply can't do here on Earth. Now, among the many discoveries Ulysses has made is that a much faster solar wind blows out of the holes in the poles, the coronal holes in the poles. You get this fast wind at about 750 kilometers a second blowing out there, and a much weaker, slower wind, about four or 500 kilometers a second, coming out over the top of the equator. So Ulysses has really enabled us to study the, the tangled 
uh, effect of the sun's magnetic field as it spins around uh, within the solar system. And it really is an extremely complex picture. Now, another spacecraft, and one that was launched just on the 1st of April this year, is TRACE, the Transition uh, Region and Coronal Explorer. Uh, and that one's looking at high temperature regions in the sun's atmosphere at extreme ultraviolet and ultraviolet wavelengths. And it's already producing marvelous pictures like this one here, which shows the, the complex tracery of loops going up from one of these active regions, these loops following the lines of force of a magnetic field coming out and going back in again. One of the other things that um, TRACE has been looking at is a phenomenon called magnetic reconnection. And this is an important phenomenon throughout the sun's atmosphere. In many locations in the sun's atmosphere, you find magnetic lines of force going in one direction and adjacent to them other lines going in the opposite direction. And if the movement of gas or the movement of magnetic loops pushes these lines together, they can come into contact and they then reconnect. They snap rather like an elastic string and take up new shapes. And a lot of magnetic energy is just released in that way and turned into very hot heating gas to temperatures of millions of degrees, producing x-rays and firing off high energy particles out into space and down onto the surface of the sun itself. Now one of the things that TRACE has done is actually produce an image uh, in some detail of this phenomenon happening. Just inside the red circle there, the uh, bright glow that you can see is where two small loops of magnetic field have come into contact, reconnected and produced the bright flash that we see there. And that phenomenon, magnetic reconnection, we think is on the large scale powers things like flares, on the smaller scale a whole host of phenomena, including the, the so-called blinkers that were discovered very recently by the SOHO spacecraft. The middle of the three frames here shows you a, a flash of uh, radiation. It only lasts for a few minutes, but there are thousands of these every uh, minute on the sun, and uh, these are small-scale examples of magnetic energy turning into, into heat and light. Well, this, of course, is all very new. We've heard a great deal about the SOHO spacecraft. What's the latest news from there? Well, SOHO has been a, an outstanding success. It's uh, placed in a position which is called a Lagrangian point. It's located between the Earth and the Sun, about one and a half million kilometers upstream towards the Sun, and that happens to be a stable position. So that as the Earth goes round the Sun, the spacecraft keeps going round so that it's directly between us and the Sun and give us this advance warning, therefore, of uh, storms and bursts of particles coming down the solar wind towards us. Now, the sort of things that um, this spacecraft has been imaging, we can see some of them here, are uh, called coronal mass ejections. In the four images, starting in the top left and moving to the top right, bottom left, bottom right, you can see around about 8 o'clock on the image there, a huge plume of material being ejected like a, a giant mm. bubble shooting out from the sun, carrying billions of tons of material. And uh, it, the time it's taken to go that distance of a few million kilometers is only 20 or 30 minutes. So you're really seeing something quite dramatic. Indeed. And it's also discovered many new comets which go very close to the sun, sun grazers, about 55 so far. And here's two that were seen just at the beginning of this month. And within a day of each other, they both plunged into the sun. They disappeared in, in towards the sun and never reappeared again. But immediately after they collided, there was an immense yeah. eruptive prominence and a huge coronal mass, mass transient. Now, that would seem to be nothing more than a coincidence, but it is a very strange coincidence that it should happen that way. Very odd indeed. You know, I, I do wonder about that. Well, yes. And then, of course, there are solar tornadoes. Uh, the image that you can see here is a huge spiraling plume of gas that's swirling around and sh accelerating up from the surface of the sun, just like a tornado on the Earth. But in the sun, the tornadoes are going up to speeds of approaching half a million kilometers per hour compared to a modest four or five hundred for the fastest tornadoes here on the Earth. But certainly these solar tornadoes are likely to be contributing some of the fast flowing material that comes out of the coronal holes at the poles into the fast solar wind. Now, uh, another area of uh, interest, very recent too, is uh, some work uh, headed up by Professor Eric Priest of the University of St. Andrews, who's been looking at this uh, phenomenon of how the corona is heated and how these loops of magnetically induced material are heated in the sun. And what we can see in this X-ray image from Yoko, up on the upper right, there is a large loop there that we can see in much more detail in the next image. We see that, in fact, it's a nested set of loops. And what uh, Priest and his team have been able to show is that the heating of those loops occurs 
occurs right the way along the loop. And what seems to be happening is that lots of these uh, field lines, magnetic field lines, are twisting together like strings of spaghetti or a bad hair day. And every point at which they connect, uh, energy is released, and that goes into heating the corona. So there's certainly some progress there in, uh, trying to, in understanding how the upper atmosphere of the sun gets so hot. We've also established now that there are things called sunquakes. What causes them? Well, they appear to be a side effect of flares as well. Uh, when a flare goes off in the atmosphere of the sun, it catapults particles up and down, and where these plunge into the sun's surface, they send a kind of a ripple out over its uh, surface. And that ripple spreads out like ripples from a, a stone thrown in a pool, but these ones are going at something like 40,000 kilometers an hour. Now, the whole surface of the sun is vibrating as well, apart from the sunquakes, and it's rather like the skin of a drum. So if I illustrate that by banging this one here, then apart from hearing the thing, you can see the vibrations as the skin goes up and down. And the same sort of thing is observed with the sun, and Soho's looking at that. What's happening is that there are a whole host of different modes in which the sun vibrates. And these are due to waves, sound waves that penetrate deep down, some of them, some shallow, some deep. They go to different depths inside the sun, the different modes. And what we see when we look at the surface is the mixture of all these different modes mashed together. There are thousands, millions of them simultaneously. Now, by analyzing these vibrations in the same sort of way as geophysicists look at seismic waves inside the Earth, we can find out something about the temperature and the speed of rotation at different depths within the sun's interior. And this image here, for example, shows us that um, you can see a, a reddish shell about a third of the way from the surface to the center. And that's an area where the temperature is rather higher than we had expected it to be. And that's an area where the, uh, if you like, the outer part of the sun, the um, convective zone, is moving at a different rate from the interior of the sun, generating a lot of turbulence. And that stirring up may be what generates the magnetic field that produces the uh, phenomena that we see at the sun's surface and atmosphere. We can also see, if we look right at the center, the blue bit indicates that the core of the sun is just marginally cooler than theory had previously suggested. So all these results are giving the solar physicists more than a little to think about. They certainly are. Of course, we're now coming up to solar maximum. We may expect more spots, more flares, and of course, more aurorae. So it's going to be an interesting time for solar observers. And certainly, as I said earlier, there's a great deal about the sun that we do not know, even though it is our nearest star. And to us, of course, the most important body in the entire universe. Ian, thank you very much. If you want the latest astronomical information, then dial up our information line, 0891-800-330, or dial CFAX, page 620. And it's newsletter time. If you want your ordinary quarterly newsletter, then send your stamped addressed envelope to newsletter number 70, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, W12-70S. And we've also done a special newsletter about next year's total eclipse of the sun, August 1999. If you want that, send your envelope to Eclipse Newsletter, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London, W12-70S. And when I come back next month, I'll be joined by Dr. Russell Cannon, bringing us the latest news from the UK Schmidt Telescope at the Anglo-Australian Observatory in New South Wales. So until then, good night. And that program was recorded on Friday, and in the last 24 hours, Patrick Moore received news that the SOHO spacecraft is currently not responding to signals from ground controllers. The Sky at Night, of course, will be following developments in future programs.